The most exciting single document I have found here is probably the Freedman's copy of the book The American Black Chamber by Herbert O. Yardley. This is one of my favorite things in the Freedman collection. The American Black Chamber came about sort of grew out of our experience in World War I. Uh, Herbert O. Yardley, who had been commissioned during the war and ran what was called MI8 in wartime and then was a successful uh, cryptologist in France during the peace treaty work at Versailles, came home and he liked the work and he was interested. He had a lot of supporters in the military. The State Department funded this organization, which was known variously as MI8 and the Black Chamber. America, uh, after the war, some people realized that we need to be reading uh, traffic, whether of enemies or sometimes even of allies, uh, to find out what was happening overseas. Some other people disagreed with this and said that gentlemen shouldn't be reading each other's mails. Uh, Secretary Simpson coming up with that lovely quote. The Black Chamber had acted as uh, this place where, where decoded diplomatic correspondence could be worked on. And he, it was a good concern. He, everybody was happy, State Department was happy, and then the new Secretary of State, Henry Stimson, in 1929, and he does admit to having said something of this sort, a, the famous quote, gentlemen do not read other gentlemen's mail, and this is late 1929 at about the time the stock market is crashing. Whether this was a moral decision or an economic decision is still, you know, unclear. But Yardley's concern is put out of business. And of course, this compels Yardley to find other ways to make money to support himself, his wife, his children, and his mistress. Um, and he will go on then to make money by writing the book, The American Black Chamber. Yardley in 1931 publishes this tell-all account of the work of his agency, which was shut down in 1929, the so-called Black Chamber. Friedman, as the more or less uh, successful competitor who carries on doing that work is asked to comment on this book which says so much about the secret world of code breaking and actually says quite a lot about current practice. He was asked regularly in public and in governmental circles to comment on it and resolutely refused. He was uh, silent on, on many subjects and this was one of them in public. So Friedman seems to have uh, decided just to take a no comment line as far as Yardley goes. Well, everywhere except the margins of his own copy of that one book. That copy that Yardley himself gave to Friedman. It has Yardley's gift plate to Friedman. It's in the library here. Not only did Friedman go through it and write his own critical commentary in the margins, but he went to the trouble of finding the four or five other people who were involved and who were still around and who could be consulted. And he had them write their critical commentary in the margins, too. He has enlisted the help of Parker Hood and Frank Mormon and anybody else who's had anything to do with cryptology. And he's written letters to them, say, what do you think of this? And he wrote to Hitt saying, well, they've stolen your work. He's stolen your work here for this article. And, you know, he collected them and then he annotated the book with their comments to just rebut point by point uh, Yardley's work. It seemed personal point of pride that, you know, that the record had to be set straight. I think that's one of the great, people are very interested in hearing about that annotated book and, and the folks who study cryptologic history and employees at NSA are always wondering what did Friedman think of Yardley and are fascinated by, by uh, Friedman's comments in the book. 
I think Yardley and Friedman were so different from each other that there was just a deep kind of personality clash. And so you see that playing out in the marginal notes. Some of them are simply, no, this happened on this date rather than that date. No, it was this person who developed this theory, not you, not someone else. So there is a, a setting of the record straight, but there's also a sarcasm and a kind of taking him down a notch. Um, a lot of exclamation points. You know, there's something in the tone in a lot of these notes that is more personal. It speaks to a more personal conflict and not just an attempt to set the record straight. Yardley and Friedman couldn't be more different. Um, if you uh, read the biography of Yardley by David Kahn, uh, I think he tries to um, uh, clean up the picture as much as you can. From Friedman's point of view, Yardley was a drunk, a womanizer. Uh, he didn't dress well. He was sloppy. Uh, he bragged about himself. He uh, gambled. I mean, name a vice, and Yardley was, was uh, seriously guilty of it. On the other hand, Friedman was very buttoned down, very abstemious, uh, very correct in his manners. Um, and, and you could see where it would be very hard to put these two men in a room together and tell them to, to work on it. You can't, you've got to take it with a grain of salt to begin with and to read it first on your own and then to read Friedman's annotations and say, well, you know, realistically, you know, it'd be great to compare what is the real truth about what Yardley wrote. It's probably somewhere in between what Yardley wrote and what Friedman claims, although Friedman does a lot of backing up with actual facts and documentation. I can't remember seeing such a revealing set of marginal annotations or one where a community effort has produced such a systematic attempt to set the record straight.